Good afternoon, a warm welcome to you all, and I hope you are keeping well and staying safe at this time. My name is Joyce O'Connor. I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. We were re really delighted to welcome you to today's webinar towards Econ European digital sovereignty. This is the first uh, event in a series of events of a new IIEA project, Europe's Digital Futures. This project will be a year long series of events and research to explore European digital sovereignty. But today I'm really delighted to welcome back Dr. Roberta Viola to the IIEA, a very distinguished uh, keynote speaker today. And we're very pleased that you have joined us uh, out of your busy schedule. As you know, Dr. Barola is Director General of DG Connect and has a really very broad brief because his brief covers communication, networks, content and technology. So you're very welcome uh, again, Roberto. In his presentation, Dr. Viola will give us an overview of the concept of European digital sovereignty from the perspective of the European Commission. Roberto will outline the Commission's planned regulatory measures uh, and the EU funding mechanisms that will help promote Europe's digital sovereignty. Roberta will speak for 15 to 20 minutes and then we will take questions from you, our audience. You can join the discussion, as you know, by using the Q&A function at the end uh, at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send in your questions during the presentations and I'll come to them once Roberto has finished his presentation. I'd very much appreciate if you give your name and designation when you're asking a question. A reminder that today's presentation and question and answers are on the record. And please feel free to join our discussion on Twitter with the handle at IIEA. It goes without saying that digital and emerging technologies like blockchain, AI, IoT are impacting our lives on a daily basis. Technology can help redefine problems, but also help us reimagine the future. And we know that areas like digital sovereignty is emerging as an increasingly prominent concept in the European Union and has triggered a lively debate. For all member states, but particularly for small open economies like Ireland, where the global digital industry is particularly important, the implementation of digital sovereignty will be significant. As I said, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Viola, has a, also a very distinguished career to date. Prior to being Director General of DG Connect, he was the formerly chair of the European Radio Spectrum Policy Group, a member of the board of the European Regulatory Group. He also served as Director of the Re Regulation Department and Technical Director of ACOM. He served in various positions, including head of telecommunications and broading broadcasting satellite services at the European Space Agency. Roberta, we're really looking forward to your presentation and thank you very much again for being with us. Yeah, Joyce, I hope you can see and listen to me well. I can very much, thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to join again IIEA in uh, one of the events. And uh, unfortunately, this time uh, it's, a, it's a virtual event. Uh, well, it's real because yes. we are all connected, yes. but uh, we are digitally connected. And to a little bit go in this journey of um, understanding together what digital sovereignty or whatever word we want to use for being digital savvy means, I would like to start uh, from uh, a dystopian perspective actually a dystopian present so we i asked you to do an exercise with me and to think of you one year ago and then to see the world today people wearing masks every being everybody at home uh, working from home connected like this and uh, then you would say oh this is a very nice movie things like this do not happen in reality mm. So I think we, we really, we really 
could not have anticipated what happened. There were weak signs here and there that our society did not have all the res ingredients for resilience inside. But as always with weak signs and always with the crisis, um, those signs are not easily recognized until they come and then it's too late uh, to have uh, a systemic response. So, and then you have an emergency response. And that's what happened. I mean, we are coping now with an emergency that unfortunately still with us. Uh, and we all hope uh, it will be over, but we don't know when it will be over. And we have found our society to have weak spots. Uh, we have found uh, uh, ourselves less savvy than what we, we thought we should have been. And we also have found that uh, having uh, re really uh, relied upon uh, global value chains and global manufacturing chains, when it comes to an emergency, sometimes you have basic needs that need to be fulfilled and you don't know how to fulfill them from basic protective equipments, from uh, basic uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, products. So I think uh, uh, Europe uh, as a large uh, continent, uh, and when you look at Europe being a digital market, the market is the wealthiest of the world. I mean, has been a little bit, I mean, uh, always looking at the perspective that the division of labor, division of responsibility, collective effort in the world would have solved every problem, which is, of course, a way that even in this uh, dystopian present, uh, we should not abandon at all. Openness is the key for a wealthy and well-functioning society. And uh, we will be defending openness on markets, and technologies, uh, services, uh, uh, even if we speak about uh, gaining a little bit more of uh, uh, empowerment uh, for our citizens and our society in terms of uh, res re having more resilience when it comes to, I mean, uh, supplying services and goods to our citizens. So this is the type of reflection where you need to keep the balance right between uh, openness and the need to have a society which is empowered. Uh, the other element I would say is the responsibility that is on Europe uh, to uh, be uh, one of the major contributors of the wealth and the well-being of our society in the world, not just in Europe. And that means many things. First of all, it means that uh, when it comes to the basic research and the basic development, uh, we need to continue to contribute to breakthrough innovation. Mm -hmm. And breakthrough innovation does not come from private companies. So though private companies are the ultimate one that would exploit it or sometime there will be a sparkle somewhere from an innovator that works in the private sector, but it's an ecosystem of innovation that you need. And that's one of uh, the big failures of uh, this crisis. We have uh, discovered that, I mean, uh, uh, private research without uh, uh, an underpinning uh, and strong underpinning from the public side is not enough. We thought that we had all sorts of AI solutions. We discovered that uh, AI is useful. It, uh, it actually, we deployed it in hospitals, uh, but it's far from being the uh, game changer that we thought uh, we would be we will be offering now i'm sure a few years from now it will be the game changer but i'm equally sure that ai in medicine ai in public services ai in, in terms of safety of our uh, transport system this is something which is a responsibility of our society to invest on we cannot just rely on on private uh, companies to do that because that's not the job uh, whilst the job of uh, the private sector is for sure to exploit this and to go on and uh, pr propose more and better innovative products. The other element uh, where uh, we have a responsibility, uh, it's the rulemaking. Now, uh, some outside uh, Europe speak about uh, the Brussels effect, uh, which in other words is uh, what we managed to do uh, in terms of the digital rules uh, uh, of uh, the govern our society and economy when it comes, for instance, from you know, things like uh, privacy with the GDPR, uh, um, the fair use of the internet uh, with the net neutrality 
law, which exists in Europe and doesn't exist in many other parts of the world, the uh, respect and protection of fundamental rights in general. So this element, uh, which is again, uh, letting market forces to offer services, but having a public governance oversight on the fundamental rights of citizens, this you can call it the Brussels model, and uh, it remains the, the model of reference in the world. And that's a bit the spirit uh, in which we have presented um, the two twin uh, uh, regulation we have presented uh, at the end of this year, which are the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act. The first being uh, how services uh, are being offered to citizens. And the second is what is the relationship between uh, those service providers platforms and the rest of the business uh, which are using those platforms to actually do business. So these are complementary goals of the two, two Ds, if you like to. Well, actually, then there's a third D, which I will mention in a second. So this uh, Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act, uh, go in the direction to say digital economy is transformative. Digital economy and society is, is going to be our new normal. Uh, but at the same time, there's something which is not right. And something which is not right uh, is the private enforcement of fundamental rights. That cannot be. Uh, so in order for things in society to be in equilibrium, things where, I mean, uh, there's ultimately constitutional guarantee on the freedom of speech, on the freedom, I mean, uh, to express ideas, within the check and balances that the constitutional, uh, modern uh, liberal constitution offers, that's for the state level, that's for Europe, that's for the member states, that's for governments. I mean, to offer services, to, to respect certain rules, to offer within the rules, that's for companies. And I think in the digital economy, this equilibrium uh, had been a bit lost because everything came so quickly and so transformative that things uh, got a bit confused at a certain point. Who should uh, uh, decide that the citizen has access uh, to social media and can speak? Who should not? I mean, in, in the real world, uh, clearly we have answers, which are constitutional, I call constitutional guarantees. So what is guaranteed in the real world, what is illegal in the real world, uh, should be also like this in the digital. World. And that's the essence of these two acts. So uh, that means constitutional guarantees that should be enforceable also in the digital world. And what is illegal in the real world is illegal in the digital world. And that what, it's what I call normal. And that was like find the part of the new normal, uh, a society which uh, after this pandemic will rely heavily on digital systems in order to live better, to be more resilient and also to work and live in a way that is more uh, near to what are our aspirations. That maybe is to live in a nice countryside, but still be part of the corporation. This, uh, again, this is not a dystopian dream. This is a utopian dream that uh, is more and more coming, uh, uh, becoming a reality. The third D in regulation is the Data Governance Act, that also we presented at the end of the year. Uh, last year, which is about data sharing. And data sharing has been a bit the quick spot of this pandemic from the very beginning, in terms of, uh, first of all, uh, having the right data of what was going on. Imagine we would have known much more in advance at the end of last year what was going really on in China. Uh, imagine we would have been sharing much more information uh, in the various uh, areas of the world uh, much quicker. Uh, in, we are trying to share as quickly as we can information, for instance, on the variation of the virus, on the mutation. But I mean, uh, uh, data repositories, uh, genetic databases, uh, where all this is available, are in the making, but uh, they are halfway. Uh, and that's not just pandemic. This is about our society. Imagine, I mean, uh, the, um, sharing data, much more data about how the, we move and how we use transport uh, to make our transport system safer and more green, 
much more data about the consumption of electricity at our homes to save money, but also to have uh, a better planet. All of this means that the data uh, allows the society to be better and to be more resilient. So the Data Governance Act, it's about this. It's about uh, uh, governments sharing more data with companies. It's about the companies sharing data among ourselves without having one company in conflict of interest with others. It's about citizens, if they want, to donate data to research to improve our society. So with these three Ds, we hope to contribute not only to a better society and economy in Europe, but a better economy and society in the world. And to come back is to the other element of resilience and the new normal is through digital technologies, we hope that uh, our society will be better, as I said. And for me, better means that uh, what we have learned during this crisis and what we have gained of the crisis, so more digital savings, uh, more freedom to organize our work will become the normal. But in order to do that, uh, we need investments. I mean, just not uh, talks like this are enough. And that's why the recovery of Europe uh, has been not just uh, a talk show, but has been a very serious decision taken by heads of state and government uh, last July that, uh, I mean, lined up uh, 2.4 trillion euros uh, for the recovery of Europe. Part of this is the so-called recovery plan which is sent up by the Commission, but I mean, organized by the member states. And as you know, legally, 20% of the recovery plan uh, should go in the direction of improving our digital society and economy. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that uh, I can give uh, a precise meaning to the word sovereignty, and I would discard uh, all the uh, the bad feelings uh, that uh, people in, the, in this event would have about sovereignty, somebody imposing uh, something on somebody else. Uh, I, I, when, if, if the meaning is uh, digital empowerment, that starts with the uh, research and development, uh, starts with investment in infrastructure and um, looks at uh, things like uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, using uh, blockchain, uh, digital identity, using new technologies such as quantum or AI supercomputing to improve our society, well, I can live with this. And I'm happy to say this is it. I mean, uh, uh, if it is about uh, closing uh, uh, borders to cooperation, uh, creating, I mean, a kind of uh, iron, ivory castle, well, that's not what we have in mind. Uh, and when it comes to the rules, once again, if sovereignty again means empowerment, uh, that's what we have in mind. Empowerment of the citizens, of companies, of uh, having uh, uh, real uh, a society of equals as much as possible. Of course, the society is difficult to equalize everything. Uh, it's uh, almost a utopian. But I mean, uh, you can make sure uh, through public intervention that distances are less. And if this is the meaning, then this is all about the three Ds, the Digital Service Act, the Digital Market Act, and the Digital Governance Act. So that's the effort. The effort is to have a society which is more resilient, a society which is open, and to take up our responsibility as public powers to do what public powers should do in terms of research and development, and our responsibility in the world. If this is the meaning of digital sovereignty, then I'm happy to use even this term. So this, in terms of my introductory remarks, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, and I'm very much happy to, to share the rest of the event in a dialogue uh, with you, Joyce, and with uh, the rest of the audience. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto. I, I think it's, it's very interesting how you, you focused on the, the power and empowerment and the power of citizens to become more involved in their society through digital. I think that's, that's really, and emphasizing the resilience and the opportunities, a very positive view and not looking at an enclosed protective society, rather in fact, enabling things to open up 
and the, your mention of the three Ds, these, you know, the Digital Service Act, the Market Act and the Data Governance Act puts a framework on that as well. So that's, that's really interesting. So thank you very much for that tour de force because you've brought an awful lot together with both the technology, the responsibility and the empowerment of the citizen, but also the responsibility of the state and the private sector. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over now to you, the audience. I see questions coming in. Um, I just, yeah, here's one from um, Seamus Allen, who's our digital policy researcher here at the IAEA. Um, and he asked the question, how does Europe plan to balance the promotion of greater data sharing with the data protection and privacy standards? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, and I, and I, I, I don't think, frankly, that one is the enemy of the other. So that uh, the more you protect, the less you share or vice versa. I think, again, we have to start uh, from uh, who was the who's the center of uh, data generation. I mean, if me as an individual, through my sensors and my movement, I generate data, I think I have the right to decide whether I want to give this data for a better society or I want to, I mean, uh, have services offered to me with this data or not. So this empowerment is the fundamental element of the GDPR. And if exercised correctly in, in a way that citizens understand what they are doing, uh, and not as a kind of bureaucratic reflex, can be the center of a data savvy society. And this is one of the pillars of the Data Governance Act. Uh, the data donation, uh, it's, it's a concept that is absolutely allowed by the GDPR, probably not very clear uh, uh, how to exercise it. It's a bit like when you want to donate your money. I mean, uh, that's perfectly okay. But I mean, there are public schemes to guarantee that the people uh, that are offering you to donate data for a course, uh, they are not actually offering a scam. It's, it's a real uh, donation scheme for a real purpose. And here, the Data Governance Act is a bit the same. Uh, give confidence to the citizens that those data organization, uh, the donation organization, are serious. Uh, so by exercising their rights of privacy, the rights of uh, ownership, the data generated by themselves, in uh, and then moving into organizations that uh, can actually allow citizens to donate the data, we think we go one step further in the debate. And the same applies, I mean, to uh, things uh, which are not personal data, but maybe be belong to a, an entity, uh, being a private entity, a citizen, like, I mean, an object in the house, a connected object, or they belong to a company. Uh, uh, what could be the reflex uh, to generate a virtual circle by which data is put in common and everybody putting the data in common gets a benefit out of it? For us, the key of this is about uh, avoiding conflict of interest. That one of the participants to this club, so to say, has a hidden agenda by which, I mean, uh, hijacks the data of the others for its own purpose. That's why we are pushing the Data Act for neutral brokering. Of course, it's not an obligation. If you like conflict of interest uh, in, uh, and you are happy with this, fine, fine for, for Europe. So the, the key to resolve uh, this uh, uh, tension or this equilibrium between privacy, protection, intellectual property and sharing, for us, the answer we give in the Data Governance Act is empowering companies and citizens to make their choice and to find organizations that could actually make sure that they can exercise those choices. But it's a very good question. Thank you, Roberto. Um... We've got a question, I think, from Garrett Blaney, Chair of Comreg Ireland's Communications Regulator. Do you understand that he'd like to ask the question live? Is that right? No? Uh, no. Is that okay? No? Yes, Garrett, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Garrett, are you there? Hello? No, I might have misinterpreted that. Maybe he'll come back later. Um, We've got a comment and a question from Turlock Denehan from IBEC. Uh, 
Sherlock says you're very modest, Roberto, uh, about your role in innovation, that you've contributed an awful lot to it. We've got a message, a question from Peter McLoon, who's a member of the board of the IIEA. And he asked the question, have EU member states fully agreed a common position and approach to digital sovereignty? Or in effect, will each country have to develop their own strategic approach to protect uh, citizens? Well, I, I, I think uh, uh, there's a desire uh, that the, the digital future of Europe, uh, it's a common future. And the indicator of this is um, the common will of a state of government to place digital at the center of the recovery efforts for Europe. And the second is that uh, there's been a call uh, uh, last October uh, to the European Commission to say, you come up in March with uh, uh, what is the vision in the next 10 years? Uh, so how digital will develop? And uh, uh, so we are given this task uh, then for the heads of state uh, government to reflect on uh, what are uh, our suggestions uh, as an indication of um, the understanding that uh, digital knows no borders. Digital requires massive investment uh, uh, to be transformative. Some of the investments are local, for instance, when it comes to digital infrastructure, of course, I mean, you have to deploy those infrastructure locally, but the gigantic R&D effort that is necessary for transformative technologies, as the one I mentioned, you mentioned, I mean, uh, blockchain, AI, quantum, uh, those kind of effort, not even the largest, countries uh, in terms of GDP can afford it in Europe. Uh, it's only by working together that uh, we can really make the difference. So I think, uh, again, uh, the, if the meaning of uh, sovereignty is uh, shared responsibility, a shared empowerment uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the common construction of a, a European future, I would say the, there's a common understanding of where we we have to go. But it's also clear that this doesn't mean that member states can forgive the homework to do. When, for instance, you look at the digital administration, in our recovery plan, we insist that digital administration is linked with reforms. It makes little sense to digitize bureaucracy. It makes a lot of sense to simplify processes to have, uh, as you were saying, Joyce, kitchen table democracy, so that it's available to everyone, services, the government as a service, and then, of course, use the best of digital technology to do that. But if you take a bureaucratic process and your, uh, your intention is to keep it, uh, to preserve it uh, forever and to digitize it, uh, then, of course, we will really miss the mark of uh, having a, a more resilient uh, and more future-proof society. Thank you, Roberto. I, I've got the question from Gareth Blaney. And he asks, can we work more closely with the new administration in the US to facilitate better regulation of digital platforms? Definitely, definitely. This is the intention of the European Commission. We have uh, published uh, a policy document, as we call it, a communication, where we said exactly this in our policy communication, that our wish, and our president repeated this uh, last week in parliament, our wish is to be digitally engaged with the new administration. We actually made a quite a concrete proposal to create an high-level uh, trade technology panel to discuss the interlinkage between trade issues, regulation, digital technologies, and to have a fully fledged agenda for cooperation. And when it comes to the digital rules, we are uh, uh, more than happy to actually contribute together with the new administration of the United States. As I said, that we're world order, we're rule of law, respect of citizens, it's the norm. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question here from Andrew Gilmore from the IIEA. EU member states recently agreed a joint statement on a European cloud federation. Can you give a sense of the role and importance that a European crowd federation guy may are expected to play 
uh, in the use of data in Europe? Yeah, thank you for this question, Gilmo. Uh, it's the, the, the goal, as I was saying in my introductory remarks, is to have um, a data savvy society. And of course, to be data savvy, data have to be somewhere. So what uh, we think it should be, I mean, uh, the way data organized is that, of course, there should be some regulation. We discussed this, but also there should be sound technology. And when looking at the future of data processing and storage, uh, we see that the world becomes much more distributed than it is today. So from large data centers and data processing facility, we will move to a more distributed uh, collective brain, if you like. And uh, in this vision, technology vision, uh, which uh, I mean, uh, translates in things like, I mean, blending uh, high, high performance computing and what are called edge computing, uh, distributed uh, and centralized cloud systems. We want to give our technical, technological contribution and also a greener, way of uh, processing and storing data. So new technologies that are efficient, allow to process and store the data closer to the users and are open. That's the other important thing. No single vendor should have the monopoly of uh, data storage or uh, data processing. Uh, companies, banks, corporations, uh, citizens, uh, small uh, uh, enterprises should have the freedom of choice should have the possibility to port their data and their service to another cloud provider if they wish so. And that's the uh, sense of the cloud alliance with the member states. I mean, to do, uh, to realize a distributed uh, uh, cloud, federated cloud system, open and uh, possible also, and that's also a very important technological objective, green. Thank you again, Roberta. A question from Paul Colleen from the NSAI. And he asked you a very, I think, quite a complex question, um, Roberto. Could Roberto give a brief high level summary of the core and differences between the three Ds, Data Governance Act, Digital Services, and Digital Markets Act, in the context of what he describes of your nice digital empowerment framework? I'll try, I'll try to. <laughs> so let's start with the first D. I am not necessarily in the importance order or alphabetical order, DSA. Well, this, the word S says it all. It's about services and in particular intermediation services uh, that are, uh, let's say, being offered to companies and citizens. And there the, the, the problem to be solved is uh, to maintain the pillars on which digital services uh, are offered. And that's something where Ireland has been fighting for and uh, we are all, uh, I mean, in favor with, uh, with, uh, with Ireland uh, on this. And I would say there's a larger consensus, very large consensus in Europe. So you should not ask for a government permission to offer digital services. You should uh, place uh, your company wherever you like in Europe that's called the country of origin. And the third element, you should not be legally responsible for things you don't know. And that's the key of hosting services, because I mean, otherwise it's the end of the cloud business, it's the end of any data intermediation business. But at the same time, the world is going on. So there are now companies that are not simply hosting providers. These companies are also offering themselves their services. So the more you are vertically integrated, the more you take responsibility and liability for what you offer. The more you are large, the more you should have responsibility in knowing your customers. In, so know your business customers being introduced, the more you should have systemic control on your platform. So the DSA provides an increasingly high level of uh, uh, um, intensity in terms of uh, check and balances that uh, digital service provider have to do. And of course, it starts with a very minimum uh, for a very small platform. And uh, it's quite a more articulated uh, set of obligations when it comes to large platforms with the idea to make sure that those services are safe and they can be shared everywhere in Europe. The DMA 
uh, the, the key word, of course, is M, stands for market, looks at the complementary, as I said, uh, objective, which is to make sure that the companies doing business on the platforms, they can actually uh, uh, reasonably stay alive and do transactions without uh, being cornered, if I can use uh, non-technical words to describe. So basically, we try to identify platforms that we call digital gatekeepers, which are essential trading partners for all the other businesses. So if a platform is without this platform, you cannot be in the digital uh, ecosystem. You can imagine two or three platforms very easily. Uh, if you are not present on these three platforms, you do not exist digitally. Then we call them gatekeepers, which is not uh, necessarily a bad thing to say. Simply, it's a statement of fact. Then for those kind of platforms, we want some behavioral rules uh, in terms of data sharing, uh, transparency of data, transparency of uh, dealing with the other businesses, uh, which you would say it's almost common sense that this happens. But I mean, beside common sense and the reflex of every business to internalize as much as uh, value, there's of course a tension. And that's where the DMA comes in with the public rules. And we are clear obligations for those gatekeeping platforms to keep the other businesses as part of uh, an open ecosystem. And for the Digital Governance Act, the key word is G, it stands for Data, sorry, Governance Act. Well, actually, there are two key words, data and governance. And as I said, it's about data sharing. Mm -hmm. Governments sharing more data with companies and citizens. Citizens sharing more data with companies and uh, research organizations. And companies sharing more data among themselves. And there are three different mechanisms, according to the three, three scenarios, that facilitate data sharing. No losers, no winners. I mean, that's not for legislation to say that. Uh, but uh, really, I, we hope much more data sharing. Thank you, Roberto. You covered that uh, extremely well. I tried. That <laughs> extremely well. I have a question here from Hugh Logue, who's the IIEA member and a former EU official. And he asks a, the question, shouldn't we be concerned that so much of the digital infrastructure, particularly the wealth generation dimensions of it, is more and more privately owned? and virtually self-regulating worldwide? Well, it's what I tried to cover in my um, introductory remarks. I said uh, we are concerned if this results in private enforcement of constitu constitutional principles. I think we should not be concerned if a company is successful. We should applaud. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, and if a company abuses of the success, uh, there's competition law and there's regulation. Uh, what has been increasingly difficult in this uh, world that accelerated in terms of digitization is uh, the relationship between uh, citizens, freedoms, and those actors. Those actors probably have been faced with responsibilities which are higher than what they should take as private companies. And uh, this is also because of the absence of rules. Let's face it. So we cannot blame, uh, I mean, uh, large platforms uh, if the rules are not clear. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what we are trying to do with the Digital Service Act and Digital Market Act. It's a democratic process. Of course, uh, these are pro legislative proposals. There will be a democratic process. Parliament, uh, European Parliament and Council, as uh, is, it is like this in Europe and producing legislation, we'll have to vote and find an agreement, and then we'll be at the European law. Uh, and this then will be respected, and that will be the norm. So uh, my best wishes of success to everybody in the web also allow me to say the small ones, not only the big ones, but yes, then yes, my, my hope is within a framework of clear rules, and the rules, again, uh, should not be privately set. Of course, co-regulation is nice, but I mean, the basic fundamental rules should be public rules. Thank you, Roberto. We've got a question here from Barry Larry, the government CIO. And uh, he asked the question, the implementation of pan-European contact tracing apps was not possible because countries 
has clearly different positions on the national need versus individual privacy debate, leading to the centralized versus decentralized app issue. How can we get shared technology solutions without shared positions on the meaning of data sovereignty at both state and individual level? Uh, thank you, Barry. First of all, many congratulations for the work you do and all the contribution you did uh, to this debate. And let me say, well, actually, all the tracing apps that use the same technology, the so-called decentralized technology, are today connected. So the Irish app uh, works already in uh, 14 member states, and very soon uh, will uh, work uh, in every member state, with the exception of a couple that have used a different technological solution. And that's a bit of a pity that uh, we, although we went very far, and now we can say that uh, those technologies are there to help, of course, then depends very much on how those technologies are used. And I think Ireland, by the way, it's a country that did particularly well in tracing apps because uh, uh, managed to link it uh, with also prevention and uh, in a way that has been accepted by citizens and uh, tracing apps in Ireland have the highest diffusion in Europe. So, and Irish citizens, when it will be possible to travel a bit more, they can use this app everywhere in Europe, thanks to the collective work. Not everything went well in this uh, journey, as uh, you are saying. And I think we should learn from this. In particular, I'm thinking about the one upcoming proposal where we should be very united and find a common solution, which is the European digital identity. Mm. I think to be a digital citizen, you need to use your personal identity. And again, I don't think the private supply of digital identity is the solution. Uh, it's, it's, of course, an add-on, but I mean, as in the real life, uh, uh, when you are born, somebody takes care to give you an identity and you use the identity. And the same should be on the web. You should be using your own identity to do many things. And of course, you are the owner of the data that you generate by doing transaction with the, your identity. In order to arrive this, this, the intention, well, has been a request of the heads of state, the European Commission will present a proposal uh, in June. And of course, we need a real good technical understanding with all the CIOs in Europe, with all the people that can contribute to arrive to a sound technical solution, which is not divisive, on the contrary, which unites the intent. Thanks, Roberto, for that. I have a co I have another question from Anne Flanagan. As has been mentioned, digital sovereignty can be a divisive term and can infer data localization restrictions or other artificial barriers to international business. How can Europe convey to the rest of the world that it is still open for business while stepping up in its global leadership of digital? Ah, thank you, Anne. That's why, uh, frankly, the word sovereignty, I don't use it that you often. Don't like, yes, yeah. Uh, because it, it could be misleading. Uh, I, I think there's no continent more open than Europe. I mean, frankly, when you look around, uh, uh, it's, it's clearly like this. And so that's why, I mean, uh, sometimes rhetoric confuses the reality. I mean, uh, we have been the one in WTO offering uh, openness when it comes to data exchanges. We have been the one championing uh, uh, trade agreements with uh, free flow data. We have a very solid regulation inside the union about free flow data. Of course, there's a, there's a little but to the, all of this. Uh, being open doesn't mean to be naive. Uh, and it takes in a trade agreement or in an agreement uh, two to tango. So if the other party uh, is interested to get your data but doesn't offer the same level of uh, exchange uh, or doesn't offer, as it in some jurisdiction, any kind of uh, uh, guarantees in terms of protecting the intellectual property right of companies, in terms of cybersecurity, then of course you have to be a bit careful. I mean, you will not, I mean, I'm sure we are all very open in our thinking with respect to our friends and families and uh, people we know, but I don't give the keys of my house to everybody uh, in a light-hearted matter. Uh, 
Uh, and here is a bit the same. I think the keys of the house we can share uh, with, with many, and we are doing that, and we probably champion that. Uh, but it's time, we say, to certain jurisdictions, you behave. That's the point. Mm. You behave. Because, I mean, uh, there are red lines that cannot be trespassed. The, the red line about respecting the fundamental rights, the red line about not attacking with cyber attacks uh, Europe, the red line of enforcing, I mean, inside a given jurisdiction, the protection of uh, uh, fundamental values. Um, at the same time, uh, I mean, it, when, when, when you discuss internationally, there are principles, but there is also the willingness to, to move ahead. And even in problematic jurisdiction, we are willing to see how we can move ahead and how we can, I mean, make sure that there's more openness on both sides. So uh, the intention is absolutely to maintain an open a di a dialogue and sharing data as much as we can. But of course, in doing so, we have to be also uh, a little bit savvy that uh, we don't give uh, the keys of our house to everybody. That maybe some of this everybody is not to be trusted. Yes, uh, good point, I think, Roberto, thank you. Uh, a, a question from Hannah Deasy from the, the IIEA and moving to artificial intelligence. Following the EU's white paper on AI last year, new EU AI regulations are anticipated this year. Are you able to give any sense on what themes are emerging as the most important in regulation in AI from these consultations? Thank you, and uh, thank you, and for this question because it gives me the opportunity to speak a little bit about AI that, uh, for time constraints, I didn't do in my introductory remarks. Indeed, we made quite some effort in the last years. First of all, to have experts and uh, the, 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 the stakeholders at large to speak about uh, whether we need rules and what kind of rules we need for AI and uh, 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 whether we should uh, uh, then present regulation. As I said, uh, in my introductory remarks, maybe the, the eyes we see AI um, are a little bit different uh, before the pandemic. If you remember the debate before the pandemic was AI is here everywhere and now we need to regulate it. I, I would say after the pandemic, we should probably say AI is not here. If AI would have been here, would have been a welcome supplementary help to find the pandemic. It's anecdotically here and there, but the effort in terms of R&D is still gigantic to, to bring us to a society that can actually benefit from it. And we should not deflect from this effort. In the meantime, there are emerging applications that more and more rely on AI. And uh, that I come to the, also the feedback we got from the white book consultation. We should not, when it comes to regulation, shoot in every direction. Just the fact that you use AI should not be uh, make something eligible for regulation. However, I think we still start maturing uh, uh, things that we collectively think it cannot be. It cannot be and I'm also referring to some tragic events happened in the last few days, that adolescents through AI algorithms are exploited on social media. It cannot be that, I mean, you present uh, fake uh, uh, information thanks to AI, and you don't warn people that this is the case. It cannot be that, I mean, uh, you use uh, uh, face recognition in an indiscriminate way without uh, any link to, for instance, a security need. So there are certain cannot be, uh, and there are certain you should be cautious. I mean, uh, for instance, we have been deploying AI in hospitals, as I said, but in some cases, the performance was not what was announced because doctors spotted that the training data set was not uh, the right one. So uh, I think in AI, we can say out of the consultation, we have seen three things happening. Really the don'ts, the things that should not happen. 
the things where you have to give a bit of a warning, I mean, uh, what we call a bit of DI risk applications, and also the heads of state and government ask the commission, be a bit more clear what are the high risk. Nothing wrong. I mean, a car, it's an high risk machine. That's why you have standards and you have tests and whatever. I mean, uh, so the, the fact that something is high risk doesn't mean that they should not be marketed. I mean, simply means attention. And then the third element is the things that are not high risk, not, I mean, forbidden, and they should simply be allowed. And in this case, why there should be regulation. So uh, I think uh, what is very clear from what the heads of states have told us and what is emerging from the debate, uh, there's a clear distinction between uh, things that are okay and things where we should uh, be be attentive. And that's a bit of philosophy according to what the European Council has asked us, in which we are looking to a limited set of rules that could be really useful in framing the future of AI in the direction, as I said, to have much more AI in our society and much more people that trust AI. Thank you, Roberto. A question now from Michael Collins, who's DG of the IIEA. And he asked the question, what is the future between the EU and the UK in terms of cooperation in the digital space? Thank you for this question. I think the future is, uh, is written in the agreement and in part uh, it's, uh, it's to be still uh, defined better. I think the first answer is that uh, uh, there's a difference to be part of the digital single market to be out. And that should be clear. And that, that uh, uh, we did not uh, uh, determine this future. It was determined by the choice of uh, the UK citizens. Uh, and uh, we have to respect this, but at the same time, we have to say very clearly, uh, it's one thing is the future, digital future of a member state of the union. One thing is the future relationship with someone that is external to the union. So there will be a difference. Uh, at the same time, being different and being, I mean, uh, uh, partners, one the union and the other uh, external member state, uh, this does not mean that certain, a certain degree of cooperation is possible. That's what the agreement is uh, uh, picturing, I mean, uh, in the terms of uh, changing data, in terms of uh, uh, selecting some areas in which common research can be, can be undertaken, and in terms of uh, Gener general uh, regulatory cooperation and also some forms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, security cooperation, which are also very welcome in the area of cybersecurity. All of this needs to be better detailed in the coming weeks and months, but the intention, of course, is to maintain a good relationship, but it will be a very, very different relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, um, Roberto. A question here from Ricardo Rodriguez asking, what exactly does European identity mean? What benefits would it bring for citizens? Well, I mean, let me give you one example, which is, uh, I mean, I hope it will come back soon, uh, Ricardo, that you want to rent a car uh, somewhere. Now, it's, we laugh at it because, say, renting a car, we really barely managed to get out of our house. Yes. But I, uh, <laughs> frankly, let's hope on it that this will be the case in not so distant future. And then you go there and uh, then there was the, 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 the long litany that we know, give me your passport, give me your driving license, uh, where you live and the credit card. And imagine instead you have a certified uh, provider that has all these attributes, the driving license, who you are, uh, your credit card, uh, in a way that you can manage this and exchange this in a secure format. Then, I mean, renting the car will be a click away. Uh, and of course, you will carefully select, as you do in front of uh, um, an employee of a rental car organization, which information you want to give or which information are necessary. So this is a very simple example. The other example could be opening a bank account or could be, I mean, um, signing a contract for something. 
So the digital identity, it's a, a collection of who, who you are in multiple dimensions, including your uh, social interests uh, and other things, and what you want to communicate to others uh, in a way that, I mean, you allow the interaction. If you want to communicate that you are a member to the local golf club, you can do that through the, uh, I mean, uh, managed identities. If you want just to communicate, for instance, using social media, your age, you can do that. Uh, uh, if you need to communicate your driving license, you communicate your driving license. And uh, when it comes to healthcare, you have uh, your nice and secure wallet where, I mean, if you need to communicate certain things to a doctor, which you authorize to, to, to know the information, you can do that. So it's a very, very different world from the collection of uh, passwords, uh, uh, pieces of digital, mm -hmm. real information, papers, and uh, things that uh, we have today. So that's our dream. Well, what a, what a great answer to that question of digital identity, because it shows the power, doesn't it, of what can happen and what we hope will happen in the future, and particularly, I suppose, with the power of blockchain and other emerging technologies. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Indeed, Thank indeed, absolutely, Judge. And blockchain is a big part of this uh, exercise, of course. Yes, uh, thank you. So, no, it's a, it, and uh, coming back uh, to the question I, uh, that was before about standards and what happened on tracing apps, that's why I said we got to get it right. We got right. to get it right. Well, there's lots of questions, and this is the last question, unfortunately, but we've lots of them left behind, Roberto. And this is from John Dooley from the DETE. Very positive that enabling, investing, and driving Europe and digital sovereignty will be balanced with preserving an open economy. It would be good to hear more on how this balance can be struck so we can strengthen our competitiveness and economic power without compromising fundamental principles of openness, transparency, inclusiveness, and a level playing field. Similarly, to stay ahead, we need to balance the need for proportionate levels of regulation at EU and member states level, which do not impose unnecessary burdens with the need to promote and enable innovation that ultimately drives economic growth. I don't know if that's more a statement than a question, Roberto, but um, I don't know if you'd like to respond. Well, uh, yes, indeed, it's a bold statement, but maybe uh, since it's the last question, uh, allows me to, to repeat certain things I, I've been saying uh, throughout this very, very nice uh, discussion we had. The first is, I think the world needs Europe and we need the world, that's no doubt. Uh, and in digital, uh, uh, Europe has a role and responsibility that uh, we have to exercise uh, in uh, driving the new normal to a, a better dimension for citizens. And in this, this respect, I mean, uh, we don't need to, because I mean, if someone closes a market, uh, it's, a, it's a defensive reflex and it's a sign of weakness, no? in a certain sense. And we have, uh, no weakness here because we are by GDP the largest market or digital market of the world. We are by tradition, by facts, the, the, the market where the most advanced rules are being crafted. Uh, we have uh, indeed uh, a weakness uh, when it comes to having neglected uh, too much in the past the power of innovation when it comes to digital. And this weakness that we need to catch up. That's why these investments in the recovery plan in advanced digital technologies are extremely welcome. But I mean, if you catch up in a race, uh, there's no reason why you should uh, shoot the tires of the uh, opponent. I mean, that's not the way to win the race. Uh, and uh, so this is a race, uh, uh, eventually the, the, the real price is to have a real uh, new normal where something what happened uh, will never happen again. Unfortunately, probably it will happen again. But I mean, at least we will have the tools to combat it better. This is the cup for re winning this race. And this is a cup we can share, this World Cup with, with others. I mean, uh, uh, but we have to do our job in Europe. We are 
too big, too important not to do our own work. And what went wrong is that we didn't do our own work. And we cannot simply blame others uh, uh, if they have done the work and now they are offering services and products in Europe. Uh, we have to done our, do our work uh, and we can maintain all our reflex to be open and, and uh, assertive by doing our work. Roberto, thank you so much. Unfortunately, time has caught up with us, but I have to thank you for your amazingly capacity to answer all these diverse questions in such, an, <laughs> in such a really good way and clear way. And I think for giving us a really powerful message of the, the power of this digital empowerment framework with our three Ds, the uh, Digital Service Act, the Market Act and the Governance Act, but also more importantly, the role that citizens, business and the states, as well as Europe can play together, that it is about openness, it is about working together. So I think it is a really uh, powerful um, presentation and particularly your answers, as I said, in such a wide range. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like on, on, on our behalf to thank the IA production team, Lorcan Mullally and Sarah Burke, and the digital policy researcher uh, Seamus Allen for their work in this uh, webinar. But I'd like to thank you, our audience, for such active engagement with Roberto and for that uh, range of questions that you so ably answered, Roberto. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate that. So we look forward to seeing you all again at our next event. And you, Roberto, I hope in the new normal that you talked about, that you can come to Dublin to see us um, and tell us more about what's happening in such a wide range and really positive digital agenda with so much happening. And also, I think importantly, with that fund behind it that will ensure it will happen. So thank you very much again. Um, and I hope you keep safe and keep well. And thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Likewise, and thank you for all the contributions we received to this very enriching debate. And thank you for the invitation. I surely will, and I hope soon.